Um, I had written down a few things to try to say in German as an introduction, and when I tried it this morning, it was, it was hopeless. <laughs> so I'm not even going to give it a shot. Um, just by way of introduction, I wanted to, uh, I'll expand a little bit on what my background has been. Um, I'm a journalist first, and so I'm not a digital executive, and I'm not a media executive. Um, I've worked as a reporter covering health care. I've worked as a, uh, in what is now called data journalism for most of my career, and in news journalism, and, in, and now in, uh, at the New York Times. I now lead one of what's really four data journalism teams at the Times, and we have four fairly distinct groups. One, if you look at our website at all, you might have noticed in the last year or so, you'll see a new section called The Upshot, which is uh, really an attempt to uh, fight with 538.com, Nate Silver, who I'm sure many of you have heard of, who left the New York Times. This was our answer to that. We also probably have a, among the best news graphics departments in the world, and our graphics department really is a data journalism shop. And I'll show you a couple of the things that they've done. My team works on investigative reports, and I'll show you a little bit about some of the kinds of work that we do in preparation of news articles. But I wanted to talk a little bit first about um, kind of how we have been innovating at the Times and what's been happening since even before the word innovation became part of our, our cadence. Um, I hope I know how to do this. Big arrow. Big arrow? Cool. Um, so I, some of you may have seen the, uh, seen the story called Snowfall. It came out about two years ago. And it was a multimedia, 3D, interactive experience of, an aval of the story of an avalanche and the people who died in it. And in some ways, that came out about a year and a half, two years ago. And it became a verb in the United States. Everybody wanted to snowfall their stories. So we would, you know, you'd go around the room and say, I want snowfall. Please snowfall that for me. And um, it was a, it was one, but one of the things that was really interesting about that story, long before we started with the idea of innovation, is that story began with the idea that the presentation was going to be an integral part of the entire process of producing that story. Historically, we would report a story. We would then go to the graphics department and say, what can you do with that story? We might go to the video department and say, what kind of videos can you make to go along with that story? This story was among the first that integrated all of those departments from the very beginning before anybody thought about anything else. <laughs> Another really good example of some of the things that were happening before we ever thought about innovation is we have a statistician on our graphics department named Amanda Cox, who is amazing. And I'm not even going to try to do this live, but I'd invite you to try it on your own. Back in 2010, during the Olympics, she was struggling to come up with a way to show the difference between first and tenth place in a ski race. And she found it, not through sight and not through graphics, but through sound. And if you go to this site, it's called Fractions of a Second, an Olympic Musical. If you press on any of those buttons, you'll hear the difference between first and last. And it sounds something like boop, ba -da -da, that's it. And that's the difference between first and last. Um, it was an amazing way of thinking about a graphic in a time before we even thought about anything about, um, about uh, innovation. We, like others, have had games on our, uh, oops, this one. We have, others have had games on our website. Uh, we've worked on the gamification of news. I had to check. I understand that when you're children here in Germany, you also play rock, paper, scissors, you know? And uh, so what one of the uh, science writers came up with a way to show how scientific learning, machine learning, uh, algorithms can beat you at rock, paper, scissors after only, a few uh, after only a few tries. So that was a several years ago, too. And we've even also, before we ever thought about innovation in news, we also had a, a graphic novel as a story, where we hired um, a comic book maker to draw our story called Tomato Can Blues. It was, this, it was a crazy story. I don't even want to try to explain what it was about. But it, it effectively was about a guy who faked his own death, and his name was Tomato Can. So. Um, and, and then in my team, before I arrived at the Times three years ago, uh, we were also using what now might be called data science techniques, and our team, before I got here, uh, had contributed to about a dozen Pulitzer Prizes before I even arrived. So 
That's all before what we might call the innovation report. And how many of you have heard of our innovation report? It became quite a stir in the United States. It was intended as an internal wake-up call to the newsroom leadership and, uh, the, and the business side leadership of the, of the New York Times. It was a months long effort uh, by a group of reporters, editors, product managers, and a bunch of other people led by the publisher's son, who is a great journalist in his own right, um, that started out as a way to say, what new apps do we want to build at the New York Times? And very quickly, what they decided is, the last thing that the New York Times needs is new apps. What it needs is some new way to get to our audience. And um, it, was, uh, it had discovered very quickly that there was a particular conceit at the New York Times, and that was that we expected our readers to come to us. We were not going to them. We were not going to where they were. We were expecting them to buy the newspaper, to go to our website, to find all of this great innovation in content that we had come up with. And so um, we needed a way to get from, that, from there to make our own content as enticing on our own platforms as Vice, BuzzFeed, Huffington Post, and others made our content enticing on their, uh, on their platforms. So the uh, result has been a profound change in the newsroom in just one year. Um, some of you may have seen the movie called Page One, and it begins with what was the traditional Page One meeting, 10 o'clock meeting every morning in the newsroom of top editors. Every department head would go around the table and pitch their stories to the top editor who would be on the first page of the printed page the next day. Those meetings are gone. There is no more page one meeting at the New York Times. There are still twice daily meetings, one in the morning, which is now earlier, as a way to set our digital priorities and our social media priorities for the day, and one later on that plans for the following day. We also have an overnight desk in Hong Kong that will help keep a 24-hour newsroom running. Um, we still have a page one meeting, actually, but it's a much smaller group of editors, and it comes after the last um, afternoon meeting. Now, um, we also have uh, a top editor who was just actually promoted uh, yesterday to get more responsibilities, and she runs what we call, have a new, what we call audience engagement uh, department. And that department has created our Instagram pages, has led Snapchat stories, is working on all different platforms to help find a way for, to, uh, to find our, to help our readers find us, really. Now, we have no plans to let clicks drive our journalism. Um, our newsroom has a very high stake in making sure that our journalism stays top notch, arguably the best in the world, and that's what we would like to be. And that's what our market value is going to be, and it's not going to change. We will never get the number of clicks that BuzzFeed can get, and we have no plans to get them. But BuzzFeed will never have the number of foreign correspondents that the New York Times has in dangerous places around the world bringing the news. But for too long, and the report made this very clear, we ignored the little things that everybody else in news did. A lot of my students, I teach part-time at Columbia University, and when they see the innovation report and they read its recommendations, they go, duh. I mean, this is, none of this is rocket science. These are things that other people have been doing for years and the New York Times had, had ignored. One example was search engine optimization. We really had not paid much attention to it. Um, uh, one of the examples of this, there was a, a very early example of how that changed. We hired a data scientist to work in the newsroom and in news analytics. And uh, right around when he was hired, uh, the Sochi uh, Winter Olympics began. And he saw very quickly that uh, if you searched for the Winter Olympics, the New York Times was not on the first page of results in Google, which surprised him. We usually are on the first page of many topics uh, results. And uh, he looked at the site that we had created, the website we created, and it was all one word. And it was effectively hidden from Google. We changed the name of the website, just the web address, nothing else, nothing in the journalism, nothing in the content, and we went from the second page to, I believe, number one in search results. So what we had been ignoring are those little things that every other company had been doing for a long time. Um, he also realized very quickly that although we did a good job of suggesting other stories from 
an algorithm did a very good job of suggesting other stories from a traditional story, much of our Olympics was being told through graphics and there were no related stories on those pages. So that change was made also. So um, changing those kinds of things has changed the way that people find our, um, find our journalism. But it's also had a profound change in the way that we think about how we produce stories. Um, one example is that, uh, for instance, I don't think that very long ago we would have thought of having a video documentary of our own correspondent in Iran. And this was a documentary that ran over about the last month or so. And in case you missed it, though, one of the things that's interesting, and again, part of what we're trying to do to help us get to our readers where they are, is you can also find it as a Spotify playlist. So it's out there as that as well. I did uh, some work on a story that ran last week that kind of shows the difference in how these uh, stories get produced now. And we're going to work now kind of from the distribution into what the journalism is like uh, on this. Um, it's called The Price of Nails. And uh, so I just want to mention that some of the things that we did we think are working. For instance, this story, I just got a note from the editor this morning that for the first time ever, a New York Times investigation uh, headline led uh, Twitter worldwide, was, was leading Twitter worldwide trending. So we've never had a global trending headline before. Um, so the first thing, this was a story, this is a story about, uh, it's called The Price of Nails, and it's about the exploitation of mainly Asian immigrants in New York City manicure industry. Um, women routinely ex in New York expect to get their nails done every week and expect to have somebody work on them exclusively for about an hour for about 15 euros. Now the people who work there have to pay the shops. The shops may or may not pay them. And uh, sometimes they get to keep a small portion of that fee. Obviously that's illegal and it uh, shouldn't be happening even in the states where we don't have very strong labor laws. Uh, Sarah Maslin-Nier was the uh, primary author on this story. One of the first things you'll see on that story is that we translated it into Korean, Chinese, and Spanish, the languages most commonly used by the immigrants in that industry. Um, that alone took about a week. As you can imagine, translating an investigative story is very difficult. It requires huge amounts of um, it requires a nuance and an understanding not only of the subject, but of how much a word matters when you might be committing libel uh, if you don't translate it properly. So that alone took about a week. Some of the other things that get done during a story like this now uh, is that you get a, um, that you, uh, an alert goes out to our email readers uh, to tell them that we have an exclusive report. That's been going on for quite some time. We will start sending tweets out, and there'll be different kinds of tweets. So for example, in this case, this tweet was not about what the story found, but it was a little bit about how we did the story that got sent out, even before we publish it. Um, our uh, Instagram site will have photos, and will interact with our readers in a way, and it allows our photographers to post images that might not have made it into the original story. Uh, we'll also have to review what, what we call Twitter cards, which are uh, the, our social media and audience engagement folks will help us pull out the 140 characters and the images that will best convey the story um, on social media. And yesterday, Sarah held a Facebook chat with readers about this story. Again, these are all distribution methods of one story, and it requires a huge amount of effort to put that together in order to organize it in that way. All of, none, none of those things alone would be a surprising thing to be able to do, but we are now in a position where we have institutionalized this kind of organization across platforms in a way that we never had before. Uh, it makes an investigative story extremely difficult to produce, though. I have to tell you that much. So I want to get a little bit more into the computation behind the story and what happens before we start doing some, um, some of that distribution work. These are some images of a story that I worked on uh, a couple of years ago. It was uh, called A Gunshot on a Summer Night. And it was the story of a young woman who had been killed by her boyfriend's gun. Her boyfriend was a police officer and uh, there was never an investigation done, so it was never proven whether or not he killed her. But it brought up the issue of what we call 
officer-involved domestic violence, and it's when police officers beat or kill their spouses. Uh, in the States, this is a big problem, um, mainly because police officers, by definition, control people by violence if necessary. They always have guns, and if they get caught, they can't carry a gun anymore, which means they can no longer be a police officer. So it sets off a particular cycle. One problem in reporting this story, though, is that it's never reported, that women don't complain when they're beaten by their police officer husbands because their husbands will lose their, his job. Um, if they call the police, the people who will come to the door are the husband's friends, and the cycle goes on. So we knew there was no official way to get at how common or how di difficult this story was. So we tried a lot of different methods, and these are the kinds of things that we would put together. There was a woman, uh, she likes to be called Cloud Rider, who had a site called Behind the Blue Wall, where she collected stories that she found over, all, over a period of about 10 years on this issue. And she gave me a copy of her hard drive. And so <clears throat> one of my first problems was to pull out of this hard drive anything that might be interesting. And what I did do was write some algorithms that would help me group the stories together into themes that we could then start uh, working with. Um, another set of documents, I'm going to mention that a lot of the documents we use as I was putting this together, um, almost none of this could be done in Germany because of your privacy laws. But, uh, <clears throat> but I, I will have recognized that I, I know that. So, uh, so here we have a, a, we got some uh, 911 tapes, uh, the emergency call tapes. Uh, we have police interrogation films. We have uh, disciplinary reports from several departments across the country of, of police officers. We have court records um, in the rare cases when people are arrested. And we also kind of collected a lot of people who were following this kind of thing. There's a, a group that puts together a, a site called Police Misconduct Project. And they sent me their history of their Twitter feed where they had listed everything that they had done on it. And we also did some very old fashioned work. We did a survey of police departments to see how they handled um, police domestic violence in their departments. We called, I believe, 75 of the largest departments in the states. And it was a very easy survey because as soon as we asked the question, everybody said, huh, we don't do anything. So uh, that gave us a, a good part of the story. Um, so um, our job is to make sense of this mess of information. And you know, it's interesting, a lot of people think about the US as having this great open government system, but really the open government movement has not helped investigative journalism at all. It tends to look a lot, at least from my side of the aisle, I guess, it looks like propaganda to me. It's what the government wants me to know when it wants me to know it, and nothing more and nothing less. It's also a way to help businesses make money off of government data. Those are the two goals of the open government movement, usually. Uh, they're not there to hold government accountable to the public at all. So, um, you know, those are the kinds of things that we will still do when we're working on uh, investigative stories. I wanted to give you a few examples of the newer techniques that we've been using to try to get through all of this clutter. I'll mention in the past, in, the, in this story, you might notice there's the, the one tweet, tweet that I pulled out. We spent eight months negotiating with the Department of Labor in New York State and eventually got a partial set of complaints against, um, against against all employers after eight months, and it was a little broken, so we couldn't use the whole thing. But we did a fairly traditional database analysis of that. But unfortunately, we only had a day to do it. So, um, so um, one, some of the things that we're doing more, much more now are gathering information from the internet in a way that nobody really ever expected you to do. And I, I don't like to. I worry about how this sounds when people hear about it because it's certainly not hacking. We never lie when we visit a site. We never use, our, our practice is to not use a password. Um, if we have to, our, what our lawyers have said is if you have to enter a password into a website, then you should tread carefully about whether or not you're, you really have a right to what's on that site. But if you don't need a password and it's out there freely, we have no real problem with 
gathering the information and rearranging it in a way that will be helpful for a story. In this case, we were in, there was a massacre at a school in Connecticut about two, two and a half years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, I forget how many children were killed by uh, a young man who had amassed a collection of weapons and um, went into the school and, and, and massacred a number of children. And we were interested in how does somebody amass that number of guns? How do you get that number of guns? It was not legal. And uh, we, we ha I know it sounds like we have no gun laws in the US, but we, we do have a few, and those few were even broken. So we were interested in how does that work? There's a site called Arms List, which is actually, if you want to buy and sell a gun, you just post it on the internet and say, I want to buy or sell this gun. Criminals are not allowed to buy guns. And if you sell guns for a living, you have to have a license. But otherwise, it's free trade here. There is nothing illegal about it. But the problem is we had no way to link the sellers together. We were interested in people selling many, many guns on arms list. And we had no way to link them together. So Griff Palmer of my staff uh, did what we call scraped uh, the website. How many of you have heard that word before? What we did was we, we harvested the website every night and uh, for about three months. And after that, what he used was some natural language processing techniques, some newer techniques in linguistics, to pull out what looked like hidden phone numbers and addresses that were buried in the text of these tens of thousands of documents. And we were able to find some sellers who were selling hundreds of guns on arms list over, over a few months. The other lucky thing that we found, which was lucky for us, was we also found criminals who were trying to buy weapons on arms list, where they would say, I, uh, I would like a gun, can't have a background check, something like that. So he could look for phrases where people were saying, I want to illegally buy a gun. And uh, the phone calls were quite interesting. You'd call the person up and say, I understand you were looking for a weapon on arms list. And they say, oh, no, I can't have a weapon. I'm a felon. I'm a criminal. That was for my brother. And it just went on like that. Um, sometimes uh, another time, what we're interested in are images. And in this case, we were interested in art forgeries in China. And what uh, Amanda did this actually again, what she was able to do was to use new algorithms and image comparisons, kind of like how when, you've, when you put an image, you can search for an image in Google using another image to say, is this like that? Using that same kind of algorithm, we had harvested the information from a Chinese auction site and we're able to see that hundreds and hundreds of the same painting were being sold purportedly for a lot of money. We were particularly interested in the work of uh, Qi Baixi, who was a very famous Chinese artist. Um, so that ended up in a, a story about uh, art forgery in China. Um, this is a story from Reuters, uh, the news organization which has been doing a lot of really interesting work in, in data science in the last couple of years. Um, and in this case, it was a story that was called the Child Exchange. It was about Americans who had adopted children from overseas and then decided they didn't like them so much when they turned out not to be perfect children and were dumping them. Um, and it was, a, it was a horrible story about them. But the way that they found the people on this was very interesting. A lot of the ways that they found the characters in the stories who agreed to talk to um, the reporters was by joining listservs. And uh, most of those were anonymous. Most people did not list their names. But every once in a while, you were able to write to one of them and say, you know, I saw your story on this list. Would you please talk with me about it? And what they were able to do was to also use some natural language processing of thousands of these messages on these boards to try to isolate just the right people for their stories on that. Um, just this story just ran uh, yesterday or the day before. Uh, Marco Rubio will. I believe he's announced as president. We can't quite tell who's a candidate and who's not yet for president because it, the longer they wait to say that they're a candidate, the more money they get to collect. So it's in their interest to, to, to put off declaring. So I can't recall whether he's an actual candidate or not, but he is, a, he is in effect. Um, but there was a billionaire who, uh, who has been his benefactor for many, many years while he was a state senator and as he moved into the US Senate. And uh, 
one of the things that we were interested in was, was he taking favors from this billionaire? And so we had one of the things we were able to obtain, which I think anybody can obtain, were the flight logs of the plane owned by the billionaire. So we could see where that plane had been over a period of 10 years, every flight that it had taken. And what we wanted to do, Marco Rubio has this penchant. He loves posting pictures of himself on Instagram. He absolutely loves it. So, and he loves posting on his Facebook page, which is public. So we were able to take every posting from Instagram and Facebook, Twitter wasn't that useful, um, and match them up on timing with those air flight logs and see where he was at the same time as his billionaire friend. What we learned was that he, w he did take the plane and he reimbursed his billionaire friend at commercial rates. So he paid maybe $100 to go from Florida. Florida's state capital is in Tallahassee, which is the farthest place possible. It's 1,000 miles away from where most people live in, in Florida. So to get to Tallahassee is a real pain. He had gone, he maybe paid $100 to get there instead of what would cost maybe 10,000 if you took a private plane. And that's legal, that's legal in the States part of our great campaign finance system. Um, and last, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, what some people are starting to call um, streaming news. And